how we can start the seminar and uh, uh, such that ready anytime. Can... Fine. Okay. Anytime is good. Cool. Cool. So I, I just start. So um, yeah, thanks everybody for for uh, attending the, the seminar uh, today. The uh, the topic would be fundamentals and applications in uh, physics-based data restoration for PD PIV. Uh, the speaker of today is uh, Fulvio Scarano, so I'm going to uh, introduce him briefly and then I leave him the stage. So Fulvio Scarano graduated in uh, aerospace engineering at the University of Naples in 1996, obtained the PhD in 2000 from Von Karman Institute, uh, and joined Teldelt uh, at the Faculty of Aerospace Engineering and uh, Aerodynamics Section in the Aerodynamics Section uh, in the same year. Since 2008, he's full professor of aerodynamics and acted as head of uh, section since 2010. Starting director uh, of aerospace engineering graduate school in 2012 and correct, currently is director of uh, the aerodynamics wind energy flight performance and propulsion. Uh, he is recipient uh, of, he was recipient of uh, Marie Curie grant in 1999 of the Dutch uh, Science Foundation uh, BIDI grant 2005 and the European uh, Research uh, Council grant in uh, 2009 and uh, was uh, a European uh, project coordinator. Uh, he promoted and supervised more than uh, 30 PhDs and uh, the research interests uh, of Fulvio uh, Scarano cover uh, the development of particle image velocimetry and its application uh, from uh, fundamental turbulence to vehicle and sports aerodynamics to the high speed in the supersonic and hypersonic regime. Uh, notable developments uh, are the image uh, deformation technique, tomographic PID uh, for 3D flow velocity measurement, its use. Uh, to quantitatively determine pressure fluctuation and acoustic emissions in uh, uh, wind tunnel experiments. Recent works deal with combination of PID data with uh, CFD techniques, uh, extensions to, of uh, PID to large-scale wind tunnel experiments by robotics, uh, the introduction of physics-based PID interrogation. He is author of more than 200 publications, delivered many keynote uh, lectures worldwide, he acts in the scientific board of many international conferences and journals, uh, measurements, science and technology and experiments and fluids, among others. So it is a pleasure to welcome Fulvio Scarano for his uh, talk. Uh, Fulvio, I'll give you the stage. Thank you, Francesco, very much for such a keen introduction. <clears throat> and um, before starting, I would like to thank um, the, organi the organizers of this uh, nice initiative, of this uh, webinars. I think it is a very important initiative, especially in these times, in order to, uh, to try to have a flavor of the interaction that we used to have lively at uh, conferences. So I have accepted with a great pleasure, initially with the prospect uh, to come to, to the nice city of Lille. And, uh, but even not uh, traveling to Lille, it's uh, still a pleasure. <clears throat> I have a, a good uh, uh, colleagues there. And um, I'll give you now the talk uh, and the transition into the presentation. Microsoft PowerPoint. Yep. Okay. I, uh, I suppose I do not uh, uh, admit people. This will be done in background by Francesco, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. And uh, go on with the presentation, and uh, I will leave some time for questions. Uh, at the end, I will be very glad to receive your questions and uh, maybe open a debate. So, um, as, uh, as already said, the topic that uh, I've chosen is one of my favorite ones, and uh, it, it uh, relates to uh, PIV, to three-dimensional PIV, and uh, the three-dimensional PIV opens many possibilities, especially in terms of uh, uh, data reduction, data restoration, so data post-processing. And uh, in, the, in the last years, uh, just because we had the possibility to measure the flow in three dimensions, many people started thinking that we can use the constitutive laws of fluid mechanics and impose some of the uh, uh, physical laws when doing this data, uh, data processing. So data processing is uh, transitioning in the domain of PIV from uh, a signal processing culture and more into a, a, a physics-informed 
type of data analysis. I, I think this is a very exciting and uh, interesting uh, transition that we see. So uh, that's this. This video has a little bit of noise. I hope you can uh, still uh, uh, hear me. Let me see. I can. Uh, so particle image velocimetry. What are the ingredients uh, for for PIV? Uh, first, we need particles. Then we need illumination. And uh, still nowadays, we make mostly use of a pulsed illumination. The video that you see looks like a continuous illumination, but in fact is delivered by a pulse laser. And it goes so fast that our eyes are not able to see the, the laser pulses. Then, of course, a very important ingredient, also a costly ingredient, is uh, the imaging system and the cameras, uh, the digital cameras. And, um, and then there is the part that relates to the way how we examine the images. For instance, the sequence that you see here, how do we examine in order to obtain the displacement of the tracers. Um, and the question, what comes more after we have interrogated these images, what can we do more? So uh, the particular case of time result PIV, it is a, a, a measurement regime where the velocity field is acquired at a temporal resolution such that a certain range of the frequency spectrum of the velocity can be resolved. In case you can resolve not only the velocity in a plane, but also in a volume, then we speak about uh, 3D PIV, and we would be able to determine the, the, the velocity vector in X, Y, and Z, and in time, for time resolved. Of, of course, the velocity vector has a, the three components, U, V, and W. Uh, there has been a, a very uh, long uh, and impressive development in the, in the field of laser velocimetry. I might even start from a single point techniques like the laser Doppler velocimetry and uh, that would cover, of course, it's a fast technique, so it's a time resolved, but uh, it would take some time before it measures uh, uh, several components in, uh, um, of the velocity. And uh, I will not go through all this list, otherwise I exhaust uh, a lot of the time of the presentation, but uh, every decade we have seen quite some important step. So uh, in, the, in the early 90s, it was common to have no more than one megapixel um, for, for, the, for the cameras and uh, um, just a hundred computer is deciding what to do. Uh, and uh, 100 to 200 shots, uh, a certain amount of, uh, of, of vectors per field, typically 100 by 100 vectors, and with about a million, a total of million of vector data. Uh, the sensors quickly became larger, uh, uh, four megapixels, and uh, in early 2000, uh, large CCD cameras appeared up to 11 megapixels. And, uh, uh, and then at the same time, also this high-speed camera, that moved from 10 hertz to about uh, one kilohertz and nowadays to 10 or 20 kilohertz with the CMOS technology also appeared. So we went quickly into a regime of uh, uh, several million vectors per second. Uh, 2010 and 2020 have seen a larger sensor format for these cameras, but I think uh, uh, an important, uh, an important, uh, a uh, step that has been taken is uh, uh, as soon as uh, we moved from uh, 2D PIV to 3D PIV, the, the extension to the third dimension has really multiplied a lot the amount of data because uh, we have moved from pixels and millions of pixels actually to voxels. And uh, 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 typically in uh, tomographic PIV, we were speaking of billions of voxels. So uh, the computer power has been quite challenged by this uh, step from 2D to 3D. Uh, if we see here, high-speed tomographic PIV, typically three-dimensional, time-resolved, or also called the 4D PIV, make use of three to six cameras of one megapixel up to 10 kilohertz, 100,000 vector uh, per field, and we are speaking of almost a, a billion vector per second. Of course, this is not... Uh, 
um, uh, um, something that you really get when you're doing the experiments. It's not that every second you have one billion vector. You acquire data at the rate of one billion vector per second, but typically it takes uh, weeks or months before you can uh, analyze all that data and, uh, um, and, and build your data set. Uh, there have been developments with uh, burst lasers and also uh, multiplying the cameras, as Brian Turo has, uh, has made a, a review of that. And also the group in DLR has, uh, has uh, performed impressive high resolution tomographic PIV uh, experiments in those years. The trend in these days uh, has shifted from, uh, I think since 2013, 2015, the trend is clearly shifting from tomographic PIV, so from pixel-based to particle-based analysis. And uh, thanks to the important development of uh, uh, particle tracking uh, uh, algorithms and the shake the boxes at the moment, uh, the, say the state of the art of these algorithms, again from the DLR group, Shams et al. And uh, uh, the talk of today will deal with, uh, to a good extent, to data simulation and vortex in cell technique is one of, is one of those techniques. FlowFit is, uh, is also another data simulation technique. And um, in the last, very last few, say in the last five years, uh, um, I've been making research in a specific direction of large scale PIV. So to try to make the experiment from lab scale to, uh, um, to uh, say less scaled or at least to industrial environment for, for air flows. And uh, this has become possible with the development of uh, uh, new tracers. And uh, these tracers are based on helium filled uh, soap bubbles so that you can amplify your domain of interest at uh, the scale of cubic meter. And <clears throat> with, with the advent of these tracers, also techniques like uh, robotic volumetric PIV have become possible. So uh, 3D PIV by tomography has been introduced by uh, Herit Delsinga in uh, as early as 2005 in, at Caltech and uh, at the conference, uh, PIV conference uh, there at Caltech and then later on on, on experiments in fluids in 2006. And I composed a review of the topic um, um, seven years uh, later. So it's very similar to what happens. Somehow it's similar to what happens in, in the hospital if you do the if you do the tomography of a patient, you have a number of emitters and receivers and uh, the amount of uh, light that is transmitted through the body is interpreted at every slice, a slice in Greek is a tomos. So at every slice, depending on the, on the uh, transmission, you can then reconstruct a slice. <clears throat> and uh, in, the, in the hospital, you are asked not to move, possibly not even to breathe for a few seconds, so that the, you are scanned. That's why it's called uh, yeah, scanned tomography. And uh, because these uh, devices essentially produce one, measurements by one plane. In uh, PIV, you cannot ask the particle not to move because the, part, the motion of the particle is exactly what you are interested in. So the sensors, uh, but luckily for us, the sensors are not uh, one dimensional, they are two dimensional, they are cameras. So in, uh, in, uh, uh, in fact, the scanning procedure is not needed at all. You just need several viewing directions. Also an advantage of uh, say PIV with respect to the uh, uh, body scan is that uh, the object is very sparse. It's only little dots that are present in space. Instead here, the object is distributed, is a dense object. And for a dense object, you need many, many views. That's why the system sometimes also rotate. And uh, instead uh, for a sparse object with uh, say a few particles, um, a few cameras, that means a few independent views are sufficient to reconstruct with some accuracy the distribution of the particle at one light pulse. You repeat it twice and then you obtain uh, uh, twice the position of the particle over a certain time separation. This is, uh, for instance, uh, the particle di distribution in space. So the tomographic PIV relies on the, oops, this computer is more enthusiastic than me. The tomographic PIV, so uh, the working principle is based on, uh, on a 3D image space calibration. This has been uh, uh, particularly refined by Bern Wieneck in 2008, where we, he introduced, uh, apart from the geometrical calibration with the plate, he introduced a, a digital way to calibrate the cameras uh, on the particle themselves. 
and that's called volume self calibration. It's very important in order to to have a, a high accuracy of reconstruction. And then there is uh, the part of uh, uh, the, the, the new part with respect to 2D PIV is the reconstruction, iterative reconstruction of a volume of intensity from uh, uh, a quadruplet of images, of image pairs. And so from this quadruplet of images that's combined with a, a, a tomographic algorithm, it produces a 3D intensity field. This is done at the time t and at time t plus delta t. Having this uh, intensities in x, y, and z at uh, two times, it's one would apply one would apply the cross correlation operation on a little box, and for every box you obtain a vector, the displacement vector for the particles, and this would be what it looks like the the result of a tomographic interrogation. Um, I'll give you just some examples of uh, uh, measurements done in uh, uh, early uh, 3D, actually 4D measurements, so time-resolved PIV, uh, were possible in water with uh, uh, good format cameras. This is an experiment I did with uh, Christian Pulma. Uh, we had available four megapixel cameras that could run up to 10 hertz, but in water the flow velocity is uh, slow. You can see it here, it's uh, 3 centimeter per second and 4.5 centimeter per second. So a framing of seven hertz is enough even to resolve the shedding, the Karman shedding um, uh, behind uh, a circular cylinder. And depending on the Reynolds number, of course, you can observe the different uh, arrangement of the flow and of the vortices and the, the, this, uh, for instance, this uh, secondary ribs that form in between Karman rollers. If you want to um, have even uh, better uh, time resolution, then you have to switch from uh, uh, regular PIV systems to high-speed PIV systems. This is another example. So this is a jet uh, still in water at the Reynolds of 5,000. So it's already uh, one order of magnitude larger than the previous example. And, uh, uh, but the framing rate is a thousand hertz. So uh, in, in what do we see here is a volume of, uh, with, a, with a vector field. The color is uh, the uh, velocity, the axial velocity, uh, say it's color-coded. And then these uh, isosurfaces are uh, isosurfaces of the uh, Q criterion, that is a vortex detection uh, criterion. And we can see very clearly the, the formation of Kelvin Helmholtz vortices that develop, then they pair. And once they pair, they lose their nice axial symmetry and they, they start developing into uh, more isotropic turbulence, say downstream in the jet. So oh, all this is, uh, uh, is possible, but is uh, quite expensive. Uh, you need the three to four cameras uh, uh, with with high speed. Excuse me. Yes, you need high speed cameras. You need a high speed laser, and you also need uh, quite a, a lot of computational power to com to, to calculate all these uh, tomograms. So let me move uh, further. I want to give you a flavor of uh, large scale PIV experiments. This is one of the very first experiment that we did. Uh, where there is a, um, a seeding system with a, a single generator of helium fields or bubbles. These are bubbles of about half a millimeter and are filled in with the helium so that they are uh, uh, almost as, as light as the air. Then these bubbles are accumulated in, in a piston cylinder system. They are injected through a tube into a seeder, an aerodynamically shaped seeder, and then they go into the flow. And what you will see here in this video that I show you is quite striking. We were quite impressed because the video is taken with an iPhone and, uh, um, and yet with just a, a simple smartphone, you can see the, the brilliance of the particles, which shows how, how much more light is uh, uh, scattered by, this, uh, by these tracers. There is some noise in background. So you see here, the piston is closing. So the, the, the bubbles are traveling here. The laser comes from uh, downstream to upstream. And here there is a vertical axis wind turbine that in this moment is not operated for safety. We can, uh, we can operate it only if we leave the, the laboratory. And here there is a number of two or three cameras that is then, uh, yeah, three cameras in this case, that has to make a tomographic analysis of, these, uh, um, of the flow at the tip of this uh, wind turbine. I can, uh, yes, this is a schematic of the, of the case and it was the first time that we could make a measurement in a, in a volume that compares with about a shoebox. 
So 30 centimeter by 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter. So much, much larger than what you can do with the, with the fog droplets. The result is something like this. Uh, you can see here the, the, the scale in centimeters. And uh, uh, these are measurements taken at uh, every passage of the, um, of the blade. I move further. So uh, uh, these are somewhat encouraging results. But uh, the more and more you move into this uh, 4D type of measurements and the more you see the bottlenecks. So uh, the fully resolved uh, measurements uh, are possible, but mostly they have been obtained in water flows. And the time resolution in air flows is possible only to about 10 meters per second. Beyond that speed, um, the cameras just don't, cannot follow the the, the displacement of the tracers and also the laser power becomes so low that uh, um, it is uh, difficult to make a, a three-dimensional measurement. So uh, second limitation is the size of the measurement volume if you want to do a, a 4D experiment. Uh, uh, my excuses for some technical hiccups. So uh, <clears throat> For a, for a 4D uh, experiment, typically in, uh, in air, uh, we don't get uh, a measurement volume larger than, uh, than uh, say, a smartphone. And in water flow experiments, you can make this volume larger because you take the tracers large, typically 10 micron or even 30 or 50 microns. You can take silver coated spheres, uh, yet we have seen that uh, the measurement, for instance, can be of the order of a, of a little booklet, like a PhD thesis. And uh, the, the introduction of helium filled soil bubbles is now uh, giving a prospect for uh, measurement volume in air that are a fraction of a cubic meter and my uh, approximate a cubic meter with, uh, with the sensitive cameras. The spatial resolution uh, is uh, ultimately limited by the concentration of tracers. So we know that uh, if we want to use cross correlation, every box must contain four, five, or 10 tracers in order to obtain a good uh, cross-correlation peak. So, but if you increase too much the concentration of tracers for a 3D experiment, the, uh, the domain becomes uh, not any more transparent. And uh, Gary Telsinger has identified this uh, regime of uh, no non-transparent domain with uh, uh, the exponential growth of so-called ghost particles. So intensity is reconstructed also where uh, a particle that is not a physical particle is uh, present. So you can increase the resolution, but then you have to decrease the volume size and vice versa. So this leads us to the, to the, uh, to the limitation in the so-called spatial dynamic range. And we know that the spatial resolution is important to estimate the velocity gradient. So if you are interested, for instance, in, in turbulence and uh, in the turbulence uh, spectrum of scales, uh, and maybe you are interested in the, on, on the, on the small scales, like uh, the ones uh, representative for the dissipation uh, processes, then, then you would need uh, quite some resolution and then you have to make your measurement volume small. Finally, um, the measurement uncertainty is more difficult to estimate for 3D measurements because it's not only affected by the classical random noise of the pixels or of the voxels, but now there is a new sort of error or noise and that is not even a, a random type, but can be a bias. And that's the one of the ghost particles. And uh, methods that deal systematically with this type of uncertainty are just being looked at. So there, there are not that many methods uh, at the moment. So these are at the moment, I think, uh, a summary of the bottlenecks. And now I enter uh, uh, the core of the presentation. And uh, I will speak about physics-based data restoration. And I split it in two main parts. And um, we can see the information that uh, is measured by PIV, like information in space and information in time. And uh, uh, imagine that you have two glasses. And uh, so you have a certain spatial density of information and you have a certain temporal density or so temporal resolution and spatial resolution. Now, these two, uh, 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 say, domains, space and time, they are not independent in the sense that the information, the velocity field, of course, has to obey some rules in space as well as in time. So the, the main idea of physics-based data restoration is that when we have abundance 
of information in space, we could try to pour it into the glass of time and obtain better time resolution or better time information, maybe more regular, but often more higher resolution. The other, and this is a, an easy process, as I will show, it's quite intuitive and easy to achieve. But the, the opposite one of having uh, information rather sparse in space and very well resolved in time is also possible. And I will explain some of the directions that have been taken. So for time, for putting space in time, uh, we speak about the time super sampling techniques. And uh, I will, uh, uh, the objective is to increase the temporal resolution of the PIV time series that are sparsely sampled. And the first model I present is a, is a very simple model. It's like the one of frozen turbulence, so an advection model. And after that, we see the limitation of this model. Uh, I will present a more complete, more complex, however, model. That's the vorticity dynamics model. And the model, this is the model that is used to run the vortex in cell algorithm. For pouring time in space, uh, we are speaking in, a, in essence of a problem of a three-dimensional interpolation of particle tracks. And uh, this can be done again by a, a, a Vic governing reconstruction. So a, a, a reconstruction that respects not only uh, mass conservation, but also the transport of vorticity. And I will show a number of applications because uh, sometimes we are convinced uh, uh, more by the results than by the theory. So uh, the temporal resolution, I think I've already emphasized that uh, the hardware that are re required for high-speed TOMO PIV are quite uh, important. In the, at low rep rate, uh, at 10 hertz, you can have almost half a joule per pulse. But if you go to this uh, uh, high-speed lasers up to 10 kilohertz, the amount of energy is just a few millijoules. And, um, and this is done with, with uh, uh, CMOS uh, imagers. The result is that the, the measurement volume is, remains small. It's a few cubic, it's a few cc, a uh, few cubic centimeters. And uh, um, another aspect uh, of, uh, um, of uh, the so-called of the, the time resolution is that we know that if you want to obtain spectral information, if we want to do a spectral analysis of the flow, we have to obey with Nyquist criterion. And uh, aliasing is a phenomenon that is very well known in time. It's the example of this uh, uh, nice uh, sport car that we see moving. And it looks like the, the, the wheels are going backward instead of going forward. And this is due to the, to the, to the fact that the sampling frequency is much lower than the frequency at which every ray of the wheel is turning. So uh, we have to obey Nyquist criterion, we all know from signal theory, and this means the sampling frequency has to be at least a twice the frequency of, of that signal. And in particular, then we would say of the flow fluctuations. Now, can we, so the, the, this part that I will speak about is, um, can we go around Nyquist criterion and uh, a push, the first way to think of going around uh, Nyquist criterion is to imagine a model that predicts the temporal evolution of the flow. So the first model is that we linearize the, uh, the trajectory of the fluid. So that by this we say that the velocity at the position x and at a time slightly after the measurement time could be approximated by the velocity at the measurement time, but uh, at a position that is preceding the, uh, the expected position, the interrogated position, by an amount that is the convective velocity times dt. So this is a very simple principle, is a principle of convection. And already this principle um, that has been used a lot with the hot wire anemometry, um, it can give a, an impressive benefit for, uh, for some cases. If I show here, this is a wake of an airfoil and uh, there is a flow at uh, 10 meter per second and we know all the velocity distribution. So if we have this uh, point and we uh, consider that the fluctuations are uh, small, then I'll give you here the, um, the result for a measurements 
made uh, first at 20 kilohertz. So the, the black line is the, the original measurement at 20 kilohertz. And if we would imagine to have a PIV system that goes much slower than these 20 kilohertz, these are the samples at only 800 hertz. So we have downsampled it of uh, uh, more than an order of magnitude. And these are the points that connect the dashed blue line. So I think it's clear to everyone that uh, the, the black line, solid line, and the dashed blue line are profoundly different. And if you would make a spectrum of the black line, you would obtain this, this behavior. Let's not look at this part where noise starts kicking in. And, but when you look at the, uh, the spectrum of the blue line, so the reconstructed, but uh, without respecting uh, Nyquist criterion, you have uh, not only the spectrum ends much earlier, but also the part that is resolved is affected by the energy that is, uh, 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 the energy of the high frequencies that needs to be contained also in the low frequencies. So the entire spectrum is corrupted. I think this is a, a very simple uh, conclusion. Now, if we would use um, the super sampling criterion. So if we use, use the, the advection equation, so the, the previous one here, just using that simple equation, we obtain a, a temporal reconstruction given by this red line, which does not go exactly by all peaks and valleys, but to a large extent is able to follow the, the, the black line. And uh, uh, when we do a spectrum, we see that the spectrum in the uh, resolved part and also the part that was not resolved by samples follows with a very good agreement the uh, original spectrum of the data at high frequency. So the moral of the story is that we could have done the measurements not at 20 kilohertz but at 800 hertz and we know as experimentalists how beneficial is that so you get more laser power maybe you have a higher resolution for the camera so there are many benefits in that. There is a question however can we apply this kind of trick uh, uh, in all sorts of flows and uh, especially in, uh, in uh, free shear flows and the answer comes with uh, the next uh, part. So the, this advection model uh, uh, becomes problematic when we have, especially when we have flow reversal or flows with a strong shear because the shear is not accounted in the, in the advection. So this is an example of a part of the, an instantaneous of the jet that I showed you before. And uh, so this advection model just breaks down if the turbulence is not frozen and we need a more complete uh, physical model. This comes uh, from this concept of go the, the, the pouring space in time where we leverage spatial resolution to improve the temporal resolution. But we have to generalize the time supersampling including this non-linear effect. And uh, I make a simple example. I hope I'm not offending anybody by using a, just a, a high school example, uh, but just to give the, the philosophy of the physics informed reconstruction. Let's imagine that we have a, a, an observation at certain time, T1, of the position of a tennis ball. So this tennis ball will be at a height Y of T1. And we also know the velocity of this tennis ball. If we would then try to predict the evolution of this tennis ball and we make a, a first option or a first assumption say well the ball will continue to fly upward uh, with a uniform velocity it is it is a first assumption and then we would expect a t3 the ball to have reached this height now uh, in the second option if we include the the physical uh, uh, um, law of gravity, then we know that the ball will travel decelerating uh, uniformly according to the uh, gravitational constant. We are not accounting at the moment for any aerodynamic effect. So if we would have a single measurement and we include a model, we can predict much more accurately uh, a future time step. So this is a simple mechanics, of course, and is even uh, simplified as a, as a point-wise mechanics. Uh, how can we apply this concept to fluid mechanics, where instead of having a F is MA, we have a set of equations that is much more complex, the Navier-Stokes equations. So in this case, we need to uh, uh, reduce these equations in a way where we can, first of all, observe all the properties at a certain time, and where we can march in time 
based on these properties. So as you see, if I go back in the previous equation, the pressure plays a role, but the pressure is not a quantity that it can be measured with PIB, at least not directly. And uh, uh, if we turn the problem into a vorticity problem, when we do the curl of the momentum equation, we obtain this vorticity transport equation. Uh, I've already omitted the viscous terms, but uh, that's only for simplicity. So uh, in, uh, in this method, then the uh, time derivative of vorticity can be obtained by the measurement of advection and stretching. And if you see the velocity is measured, by PIV, the vorticity can be inferred by making finite differences or, or any sort of a, a estimator of derivatives. And so these two terms can be estimated. This means that we can estimate, in fact, the time, uh, the time advancement of vorticity. How far can we go? So now I have to explain really the algorithm of this uh, uh, super sampling by uh, Vic simulation. This is the vortex in cell. Uh, um, initially proposed by Christiansen already 50 years ago. So the, uh, the, discre uh, the, the flow is a discretized in, in vortex particles where we have to predict how the position evolves. So this is the, the advection part and how the strength of this vortex particle is evolving. And that's due to the, to the tilting and stretching term. And uh, uh, I will go uh, rapidly over this. The slides will be available to you and this is a published material. So there is an algorithm whereby we have the, the velocity measurements, we calculate the vorticity on it, then we discretize and add back the particles, we calculate the new strength, and then we interpolate the result back to a, a Cartesian grid. And in this Cartesian grid, then we go back from vorticity to velocity. That can be done from this, uh, based on this equation, is again the solution of a Poisson problem. So we need a boundary condition for the, for the velocity. So when this is uh, uh, done, we can apply it to, um, to an experiment. And I present here two, uh, two uh, examples. The first experiment is uh, the wake behind a NACA airfoil. And the second one is a transitional jet. The first experiment, uh, is uh, meant to be a validation of this method where uh, we assume that the advection model is valid as we saw before in, in 2D. Uh, the airflow is already 14 meters per second and the acquisition frequency is uh, 2.7 kilohertz. So this was already a challenging 3D experiment. The second experiment instead is uh, somewhat to prove that uh, the advection method uh, is inadequate but the, the vortex in cell can provide um, a right, uh, a correct reconstruction, a correct uh, supersampling. So let's move to this uh, 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 turbulent uh, wake. So the measurements were made at about three kilohertz. We take data uh, subsampled again at uh, on one every four. And this is, this is from the, the, the full data set and this is from the subsample data set. And from the subsample data set, we apply the uh, uh, super sampling. So from sample one and sample five, uh, the, um, the equation of uh, the big equations are used and we obtain now a time evolution from this sample to that sample. And this time evolution was not measured or at least is, has been taken out of the measurement in order to see whether the algorithm would work properly. Um, I have to say that this type of approach can be done, but only in 3D, because in 2D, uh, the, the fluxes of vorticity through the plane cannot be uh, accounted for. So uh, the, the, the validity of this approach, the VIX simulation, is only for 3D data sets. If I, if I then take a control point and I do the same exercise as we did before, the reference measurement is taken at uh, 2.7 kilohertz that we know is uh, just enough. And this would be the subsampled measurement at the 600 hertz. You see that uh, many peaks and valleys have been cut by the, by the, by the poor temporal uh, uh, resolution. And then uh, with the um, super sampling, this is the advection model, would reconstruct a good number of these peaks and valleys. Not everything perfect, but uh, uh, much better certainly than the linear interpolation. And when we look at uh, the vortex model, we can see that the vortex model is in essence is on top 
of the advection model. So this gives us some confidence that uh, the vortex model is at least as good as the advection model, and it works in, uh, uh, in, uh, in case of, uh, of a purely advected flows. Now we know that uh, in principle, the vortex model should also work when you have nonlinear effects. And I will go into that. Um, uh, for sake of time, I will not speak too much about uh, the, the error estimation. This is, uh, in, um, this is obtained in the article that I include as a, as a reference. So let's move now on the analysis of a jet, this transitional jet. The measurements of this jet were taken at one kilohertz. The vortices, uh, if one would make the analysis, are shed at 30 hertz. This means that if you want to make a, a proper time reconstruction, you should measure this flow at least at 60 hertz. So one kilohertz is more than enough. Uh, what we did is to subsample one kilohertz, uh, uh, a factor 40, and obtain uh, measurements only at the 25 hertz. This 25 hertz is uh, well below the Nyquist criterion because it's only 0.4 of the Nyquist frequency, whereas we would like to have two Nyquist frequencies. Uh, excuse me, um, tw twice 30 hertz. So this is the Nyquist frequency. And uh, the, the super sampling back to one kilohertz is done by three methods, a linear interpolation, the advection, and the big simulation. I will show you here the results. This is the, the reference data. The yellow uh, uh, ISO surface is in fact the axial velocity at a uh, uh, value of 0.4 meter per second. The green donuts uh, uh, are clearly the vortices identified by the Q criterion. And we see that uh, a linear interpolation of this, uh, of this uh, uh, process at uh, uh, 25 hertz is absolutely uh, insufficient. The, sometimes the vortices are even seen moving in the opposite direction than the, the physical direction. If we would use the advection model, the, say the velocity in the core of the jet, it's uh, uh, moving at least in the right direction, but all the shear layers, all the instabilities are completely distorted by the non-linearities of the flows that are not captured by the advection. And finally, if you would use the uh, vortex in cell type of reconstruction, uh, and you look at the reference data and the big data, they are quite in line with each other, apart from a slightly different level of the small level fluctuations that are filtered out in, uh, in the process of uh, integration. So um, <clears throat> this reasoning is similar to what I did in the past, uh, so I will uh, skip it. And uh, uh, I draw some conclusions now. So the PIV experiments contain abundant spatial information truly usable only for 3D measurements, because there you can impose the physical laws. The uh, resolved spatial information can be used and poured uh, as a temporal information as long as you have a model. Now, the advection model is rather adequate if you deal with uh, uh, boundary layers and uh, flows that do not separate over wakes, so like, a, like a far wakes. Uh, the vortex in cell model is proven to be more general and, and more suitable. At the moment, it's only demonstrated in incompressible flows. We have never realized experiments in compressible flows 3D. So the time supersampling, in conclusion, gives us really a, a consistent spectral estimates from measurements that are acquired at a frequency well below Nyquist limit. So in this way, we can say that it is possible to go around Nyquist limit if you have spatially distributed data. This is, I think, an important conclusion to, to remark. Um, I have included here some, some further reading, uh, especially with the works that concentrate on uh, spectral analysis of uh, PAV data and uh, uh, temporal and frequency reconstruction of uh, PIV data. Uh, so, um, for, uh, we have seen that so pouring space in time helps us in lowering the cost of the hardware, so lowering the, the requirements of hardware when we want to perform time resolved PIV. And now, what about pouring time into space? Why would we be interested in it? 
we want to do pouring time into space, for instance, when we have a 3D measurements that are under-resolved because the tracers are too sparse. For instance, because the volume, the, 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 the domain is too large and you cannot put too many tracers. Um, so that's a why and how uh, that can be done by, again, enforcing the governing laws that account for a certain time history. So let me uh, give uh, a bit more background. So tomographic PIV is currently limited to, to the size of a, of, a, of a smartphone. The seeding concentration, in fact, does limit the spatial resolution. This number that you see here is the typical PPP. The PPP, these are slices of a measurement at a different uh, uh, concentration of tracers. This was acquired by Matteo Novara already more than 10 years ago. So this is a, a half percent, 1% PPP, 3% PPP, 5% PPP is a bit the golden rule uh, for a tomographic reconstruction, but also for the advanced uh, particle, Lagrangian particle tracking. As soon as you start going to 10% uh, PPP or 20% PPP is a, I, I would call it almost suicidal. You do an experiment and the, 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 the algorithm is not really able to define individual particles and will make, a, a, say, a soup of intensity that has not much to do with, with the particles. So the, the, the measurement is really ghost dominated. Um, so laser power, as I said, limits the, the volume size. And this means that in some cases we want to uh, uh, shift from far of droplets where you would also see only see a smoky pattern, you can't re reconstruct particles, uh, into uh, more discrete tracers. This is an example of a HFSB tracers, these helium fields or bubbles. Then you end up with uh, 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 tracks, Tomo PTV or Shake the Box, and, uh, but these tracks are rather sparse in space. For instance, for on this object that is 10 centimeter, the typical distance between particles could be even two or three centimeter. And it is much coarser than what we are used to with PIV. If you would make a, an interrogation window, you would have to make a block of maybe uh, four by four by four centimeters. So it, the, the result would be extremely coarse. Uh, uh, so the, the challenge now is to try to increase the quality of the velocity reconstruction. This is a problem as old as the, the times of uh, 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 PTV and super resolution PIV. The problem has been uh, uh, afforded by Keen and Adrian, Stitu and Rit Muller, uh, solenoidal filtering as well, and, uh, and optical flow always about in improving the quality of, uh, of reconstruction from a certain amount of information. Uh, in uh, Jan Schneider's PhD thesis, he, he could calculate that in principle, the, uh, the largest wave number that can be resolved based on particle tracking is actually uh, uh, about six times the concentration, uh, uh, the, the cubic root of the concentration, whereas the largest wave number you can resolve by cross correlation, assuming that cross correlation is a sliding average filter, is only one and a half times the, cor uh, the, the, the concentration in one third. So we will see why that is the case. Uh, if you have uh, two particles here in these two positions, just a linear interpolation will allow you to have a vector in between here and, and a grid that typically has a distance that is as large as the distance between particles. If you want to make PIV, the, the interrogation needs to include several particles. So uh, although the mesh can be done fine as you want with the, the overlapping factor, the interrogation window in the end will determine uh, your spatial resolution. So the spatial resolution really suffers from this uh, uh, averaging effect of the cross correlation. Finally, the, the intention is to uh, an investigate a, a way where you not only consider the velocity, but also other information, so the history of the particle motion. Uh, in, in this specific case, we consider the velocity and the acceleration as being independent variables to reconstruct the velocity field at a certain time instant. And this technique is called VIC plus. The plus stands for the fact that we have also DDT information uh, on top of the uh, velocity. How this can be done? Uh, the particle trajectories are intended as uh, uh, obtained by uh, uh, particle tracking uh, algorithms like a Tomo PTV or by Shake the Box, which is now the, the state of the art to produce uh, particle tracks. 
And then <clears throat> the problem can be regarded as a problem of a, a, a cost function minimization. So uh, a cost function J is built based on the difference between uh, uh, the velocity that you compute, that you, your unknown, and the velocity at particle position, the one that comes from PTB. And this could be subject to the divergence constraint. This is already a first physical law. Um, uh, these type of methods have already been uh, proven valid, uh, and uh, they, are, uh, they are already applied in a, in a number of uh, experiments. I want to move now to the, to the Vic plus method, and that takes into account u and du dt, the material derivative of the velocity. So in this case, the cost function is, is built of two parts, the cost function on velocity and the cost function on the uh, material derivative, on the acceleration. And uh, in order to, um, to match them, we need a weighting coefficient that weights the importance of, of the two. Excuse me again. And uh, the minimization has to minimize indeed this global cost function. The, the problem is, uh, uh, is intended in this way, uh, uh, a first initial solution for the vorticity is intended. And then uh, the algorithm marches forward with the, with the VIC and calculate, calculate the value of this cost function for a certain number of states on the flow. Then once this number of states is, calculated, is, uh, is obtained, uh, a gradient estimation technique that is, uh, uh, say, computationally convenient is the adjoint technique, tells us what is the minimum uh, for J for the specific uh, state of vorticity and then returns into velocity. So I, we have uh, looked at, uh, we have asked the, our friends uh, that do DNS simulation to produce a DNS data set for us where you can make a numerical assessment in a turbulent flow. And this is a so flow from Bernardini and Pirozzoli, and this has been also used in, in other studies. So this is a, a simulated PTV experiment. We introduce the particle randomly in the volume, and then U and UDT are interpolated at uh, particle locations from the DNS data that is very, very, say, uh, fine on a very fine grid. And, uh, uh, and then we have looked at uh, a range of seeding concentration, like if you make an experiment at uh, 150 particle per cubic uh, uh, boundary layer thickness over one delta, one delta cube we call it, uh, up to 4,000 particles. Uh, and uh, uh, we reconstruct then the velocity field with the number of techniques from the conventional cross-correlation PIV, that would be the one of tomographic PIV, to a simple interpolation technique, to uh, also another state-of-the-art technique for PTV that has been introduced many years ago by Aguirre and Jimenez, the adaptive Gaussian window, AGW, and then uh, the divergence free filtering, and finally the VIC plus technique. And this is quite an interesting result. This is uh, the DNS uh, uh, field of uh, uh, lambda two criterion. And at uh, low concentration, PIV uh, builds uh, essentially nothing of it. And only at the highest concentration, without considering any ghost uh, noise, then some structures start appearing in PIV, but it still cannot be compared to what is the true flow field uh, of the, say, or the, from the numerical experiment, from the numerical DNS. Already a linear interpolation, in fact, does a better job then the cross correlation. So this is a bit striking because uh, indeed indicates a linear interpolation already has a better resolution than cross correlation analysis. If you can rely on the, on the individual particle information. Adaptive Gaussian windowing is rather similar to linear interpolation. And then as soon as you introduce so-called uh, uh, physics constraints, for instance, if you impose that the divergence has to be zero for an um, um, incompressible flow, you already see that the resolution of the reconstructed uh, velocity field is much, much higher and much closer to the DNS. And for the VIC plus, I think we have a very comparable case. In order to appreciate the differences, we have looked at the, at the turbulence statistics at a low uh, concentration and at high concentration. And you can see, especially for the uh, turbulent stresses, that uh, uh, the, the, the VIC plus and the um, divergence free 
algorithm are this uh, uh, Chayan and Blue uh, um, very quickly adhere to the DNS uh, reference and uh, at uh, the highest concentration they, they really follow very well the DNS uh, uh, reference. Instead, a cross correlation with PIV is really not able to capture this fluctuation. It barely takes 50% of it. Linear and AGW are in between 50 and 70% of the, of the result. To complete this and to try to convince you that uh, we should think of a, a working particle based and less uh, cross correlation based when possible by the hardware. There is another experiment that was conducted by uh, Elsinga and uh, Yodai, and this was a turbulent boundary layer uh, that was the, the twin experiment of a DNS simulation. And they were quite surprised that even setting up a very good tomographic experiment, although the velocity statistics would match very well, but the fluctuations of vorticity were not captured at all, and the uh, turbulent dissipation was also not captured very well, was typically 50% of the true value. So uh, in that case, you, see, you can see that uh, with respect to the DNS data, that is this uh, black line for omega x, omega y, and omega z, uh, the, 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 the PIV analysis, even when tailored with a different window size, stays well below the, the, the value of the, of the DNS simulation. And this is from a true experiment, not anymore from a computer simulation. And the use of a particle-based analysis, in this case with the VicPlus, brings uh, the data back uh, almost one-to-one uh, -one, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the DNS simulation. So this was quite uh, comforting. Do I have some more time? Uh, yes, yes, go, go ahead. I think that's... Uh, yeah, I think I will need yeah. another 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, that's okay. That's fine. Um, yes, uh, this is... Uh, um, in that, that was in the statistics, but uh, now when we look at the, co the coherent structures, this is also quite uh, important because sometimes we inspect these flow fields and we want to uh, examine the vortices. The, the, the structures and the isosurfaces that could be built from the TOMO PIV analysis, depending on the, the threshold you choose, either they are too full or they are too empty. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and very often these vortices start uh, becoming, say, detached. So the interpretation of that is more difficult. And uh, a more accurate, of course, a, a higher resolution analysis gives you also the vortices connection that could be important in order to build uh, a model or a, or a physical uh, uh, mechanism of this, um, of this phenomenon. Uh, I will jump on this because this is um, a bit repeating, is another experimental assessment on, on a jet, but this is, uh, is uh, preceding that. So I will conclude on this uh, and also leave some open question on this area of uh, pouring uh, time and space. So tomographic PTV and shake the box yield spatially sparse velocity measurement. In large scale PIV measurements using HFSB, the sparsity is even more uh, dramatic. So uh, we do need some techniques to bring the available temporal information onto uh, in terms of spatial resolution. So putting time into space is a, a procedure where velocity and material derivative are used to reconstruct a bit denser velocity field and vorticity field. So uh, this working principle has been evaluated with both numerical data, but uh, has been assessed on experimental data. What is left to do uh, is not yet uh, completely clear. What is the spatial response when pouring time in space? So if you are asked what is the actual resolution of it, it's not as easy as uh, looking back at uh, linear filter theory to answer that question. Also the application on large scale 3D PIV experiment is just starting with HFSB. And um, uh, how do we, oh, sorry for the typo, I meant to estimate. How do you estimate vorticity or entropy in turbulent flows when you have this sparse data? It could be a specific uh, uh, challenge uh, given the sparsity uh, to know at which uh, wave number uh, the, the values should be uh, cut off. Um, I want to conclude by uh, presenting, uh, um, I find uh, an interesting application. I know that in Lille there is, a, there is a quite a tradition of uh, uh, research on uh, wall-bounded uh, turbulence and also there is uh, one of the themes is uh, flow control. So I found it's a good opportunity to present uh, some fresh results in, uh, in the boundary layer turbulence uh, controlled 
by Spanwise wall, wall oscillation technique. This was one of my recent uh, master students. And uh, um, so as you see from the video, there is a wind tunnel. The flow produces a, 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 a thick uh, boundary layer of a few centimeters. And then this boundary layer at some moment is perturbed in its state by uh, wall oscillation. This, uh, uh, the ability to reduce the turbulent skin friction is known mostly from a numerical simulation and some experiment, but it was not uh, visualized clearly enough what is the, the working mechanism of this uh, uh, drag reduction. So we decided to do an experiment with a PID at high resolution to measure directly the, the skin friction, so the 2D experiment, and the 3D experiment that would allow us to visualize how the high speed and low speed streaks are altered and how the air pins are reorganized or how, how they are suppressed uh, along with the, the nasty part that is the vertical transport uh, by the ejections events. So the, the schematic is here a plate where we have a trip to produce a, a, a radia a turbulent boundary layer and uh, uh, developed uh, uh, over a certain length then uh, measured with a, both planar PIV and a tomographic PIV over a small, a small layer. I will, uh, I will show already the planar PIV was not uh, uh, an easy job because uh, as you know, uh, you when you measure close to the wall, you also have the reflection of the wall and you even measure inside the wall. Those who have done those measurements, they, they know exactly what I mean. So you see a velocity field above the wall, but you also see a velocity field below the wall. And the, this uh, is not so, such an annoying feature because you can use these two velocity profiles to infer what is the exact position of the wall. Actually knowing the exact position of the wall is very important if you need to know the uh, so-called uh, uh, shear rate at the wall, the, um, the, the, the skin friction at the wall. And this is exactly what, what was done, inferring the velocity and then the uh, wall offset was put back to zero and uh, a linear fit to a certain number of points in order to, to define what is the du, dy at the wall. So the, the, in a linear scale, the difference between uh, control with control and without control seemed very small, but in fact, the fact that uh, here the slope is slightly less is the, uh, the explanation for the skin friction uh, drag reduction. So to achieve this resolution, the window could not be square, has to be made anisotropic in order to improve the wall normal resolution. I'll continue. And this is a U plus Y plus diagram, of course, to uh, identify the different regions uh, of the boundary layer. The tomographic PIV data checked on the planar PIV data had a reasonable level of agreement uh, for the mean. The interesting part for the flow physics comes here when we see that the U prime fluctuation, streamwise fluctuation, are significantly dropped when we move from a stationary wall to oscillation at a prescribed uh, um, uh, oscillation time, in this case, 94 uh, normalized uh, time units, which is also corresponding to what is uh, referred in literature. And if you go to this uh, uh, normalized time units, and if you go also to a certain value of the uh, oscillation velocity, then uh, you go from, uh, in fact, you start seeing actually a nice positive drag reduction, 5, 9, 10, and 15%. We could not go beyond this because mechanically we could not oscillate the plate more than 15 hertz uh, or more than with a higher amplitude than, uh, than just a two centimeter. But the, the drag reduction of 15% was considered large enough to be above the noise level or the uncertainty of the measurement. And then the, the, the question that comes is how does the flow look like? if the drag is reduced. What, what has been changed in flow? So this is a, a snapshot of vorticity for the full boundary layer. When the wall is stationary, we see this uh, uh, shear layer, that is the boundary layer, the shear of the boundary layer. And then a part of this shear layer is, is, a, is stripped off in the, in the ejection events. And then the head of the air pins is, uh, has something to do with these ejections. You have groups of air pins, packets. Uh, Ron Adrian has, uh, has, uh, has said much about that. So for the, if we concentrate only in the range between zero and 200 Y pluses, we can see that indeed this uh, formation of, a, of a, a, a hairpins is, uh, uh, so they appear with quite some 
um, as agglomerates, almost as a train of hairpins, the hairpin packets. And uh, uh, they together, they induce a very strong and very frequent Q2, so-called ejection event. And we observed that when the wall instead is oscillating, the hairpins are not disappearing, but they are much less frequent. And therefore, we expect that their self-induction has been uh, 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 disturbed. Um, the 3D data was really necessary to see what's going on here. And in this case, I present you two plates. In this case, uh, the, the, the wall is a stationary wall. The color is the velocity. And so blue and red uh, uh, mean respectively, uh, say, uh, the low speed streaks and high speed streaks. And the uh, ISO surfaces are in, um, uh, it, we have an ISO surface of low speed, oops, let me try here again. The, um, the violet is uh, uh, an ISO surface of a uh, uh, low speed uh, um, velocity. And the green instead is uh, the uh, lambda two criterion, so an identifier for vortices. What do we understand here? We see certainly this elongated uh, organization of the boundary layer. We also see that uh, there is uh, the, the vortical structure essentially adhere to the low speed regions and they kind of horse ride the low speed uh, uh, streaks, so producing by this a cane or, or even a complete hairpins. When we move to the oscillating wall instead, we, uh, we see that uh, first of all these streaks are not as long and not as coherent and not as deep as in the case of a stationary wall. And the, um, also the vortical structures, if, I, if we make an integral of it, are less present and less active than in the case of a stationary wall. So the, the, in, in synthesis, uh, a first principle approach to describe this physical mechanism is as follows. The, the stationary wall organization sees a low speed streak here with some high speed streaks on the side. The low speed streak is the part where you have the ejections, decelerated flow that goes upwards. And uh, uh, the hairpins tend to induce, say the, 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 the preceding hairpin, is inducing the one that follows, that also induce a younger hairpin that follows. So this is, uh, this is called, reported as the auto generation of hairpins. Instead, when the wall is being oscillated, part of the streak and also the legs of the hairpin are shifted relative to each other. So they can exist, the hairpins, but the induction, oops, the induction of flow from this hairpin onto the following one is much less or, or nothing at all. So this, this means that by just uh, uh, offsetting the, uh, the front side to the back side of a streak and of, of a hairpin train, you can locally and uh, uh, instantly disrupt the uh, so-called uh, uh, the auto-generation. You can inhibit the auto-generation. We have also reason to think that uh, because of the oscillations are in this moment only sinusoidal, the most effective part is when you have the largest rate of displacement and then you, uh, the airpins will reform and will maybe even coalesce in the point where you have to invert the velocity. Um, by this, I conclude the presentation. I thank you very much for, for your interest and attention. And I also wish you a, a very healthy year, uh, possibly better than uh, the one of past year. Um, so this concludes the presentation. I take just one moment to uh, say advertise. Uh, if any of you is interested in uh, the topic of urban air mobility, we are organizing in uh, two months from now in Delft. It was intended to be a, uh, a on on-site symposium, but now it will be online. So it maybe it's easier to participate. So we organize the, the, the first uh, uh, symposium on urban air mobility. And uh, please contact us if you are interested in, uh, in this topic. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, Fulvio, for, for this great presentation. Uh, I would like not to uh, take any minute from the audience and uh, I would like to, uh, to, to open the stage for questions. If, uh, if you... So is there any question for, uh, for uh, Fulvio? Uh, I have one. Can I uh, ask? Uh, Go ahead, Jamal. You're welcome. 
Yeah, uh, for you, for the, your first uh, explanation, <coughs> you reconstruct from space the time. And uh, what I would like to know is that when you use the VIC, you have to take a lot of derivative of your uh, spatial data. And uh, as you know, the, the data is uh, limited uh, in bandwidth, in space, and is noisy. So how do you manage that? And do you have an idea of the limitation of your reconstruction in terms of uh, time, time uh, in terms of frequency? Yeah, very, very, indeed. Very nice, uh, very nice uh, question. Thank you for that question. Um, I've not revealed all the tricks. <laughs> uh, in the, first of all, uh, let's speak about the noise. Yeah? And uh, we're speaking about the noise. Uh, the data in uh, the PAV data is cross correlated, but is cross correlated with more than one exposure. I've done that in order to try to have as noise free data as possible. So I think that the noise was at really at a low level. Uh, usually, if you take independent snapshots, you have to ask yourself how much of the noise you are advecting. Uh, so you meant the, the big or advection? They are kind of, they, they suffer from the, the yeah. phenomenon are the same. Let me say with the big, big super sampling. Um, because you have to take a lot of derivative for this one. You have to do the vorticity. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you have to do the transport of it. You are right. Yeah, you have to do the tilting and the stretching. Um, uh, this is a 3D data. So uh, you are right, there is a caveat. You have to first look at your data and make sure that the data is not too noisy. <clears throat> if you use a, a cross correlation, for instance, you have to use, uh, 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 say, relatively large windows, so use the window deformation, maybe a good number of iterations, maybe a Gaussian weighting for the windows, that's also a good idea. And um, I, my experience is that the data is of a quality that it, you can do these spatial derivatives. The second part, I think, is more important of what you're asking, uh, uh, Jean-Marc. Am I talking to Jean-Marc? Yes. Yeah, yeah Jean-Marc, the second part is more important. In fact, uh, it's true that you can pour space in time, but the, the frequency that you can obtain in time can never be higher than the uh, largest wave number you can resolve. So imagine you can resolve wave numbers down to, uh, uh, I speak of length, say one millimeter. You can resolve scales down to one millimeter. So wave number of one over a millimeter. <clears throat> if that is your smallest structure that you can resolve, and if your flow velocity, let me say, is at one meter per second, this means that potentially you can obtain in the spectrum energy up to only one kilohertz because anything else cannot be reconstructed in, in space. So you have first to produce these wave numbers before you come back or you transport them to produce the so-called frequency spectrum. I, I hope I am answering your question there. And in the article that I had with, uh, in, in the previous one, I think with uh, uh, Peter Moore, the, the, this article of 2012, I do give the indication of uh, what is the relation between the maximum frequency in the spectrum that you can reconstruct for the given maximum wave number. The wave number depends on the window size, which ultimately also depends on the uh, camera resolution and the, uh, the, the, the particle density. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, maybe there is another little point I would like to highlight. Say the, the advection, the nice thing of it is that uh, although it works only for these uh, uh, frozen flows, but I could apply it very easily in 2D flows as long as there is a good, the, the dominant component is in plane. Even if there is a little bit of auto plane, that doesn't matter. And it, when we tried to do VIC in planar data, it was a disaster. It was not working at all. So VIC is much more sensitive to to say to the vorticity flux in and out of the plane. So VIC has to be applied in 3D data. Um, okay, is, uh, um, is there someone else who wants to, to, to ask a question to Fulvio? You can directly open your mic if you have a question. Can I ask one question? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, so thank you for this uh, very interesting talk. 
you, you mentioned the fact that when you want to reconstruct the pressure, you have to solve a Poisson equation. And uh, here there's a problem with the boundary condition. So I would like to know how sensitive is the boundary condition and how do you determine this boundary condition as well? Yeah, very good question. My apologies. In the, in, the, in the announcement of the talk, I had promised also to speak about pressure from PIV. In fact, in my talk, I have not covered uh, pressure from PIV. Uh, the Poisson equation is also used <clears throat> for the big type of analysis. So uh, uh, I think your question is still related to the pressure or you want to know the problem of sensitivity to boundary conditions of VIC just for the velocity. What, what is your preference? Yeah, yeah, it's when you solve the, the, the Poisson equation, uh, you, you mentioned the fact that uh, you need to set some boundary condition, you need to, to have some boundary condition. And uh, I was wondering if it is sensitive to the, to the definition of the boundary condition that you choose. Yeah, I'll give you my experience. I will find that uh, uh, the boundary condition for the problem of a VIC and super sampling is uh, really uh, unproblematic. Um, it's not very important. We take just the data on the boundaries and uh, we can estimate. Oops. I will have to leave in 15 minutes. Um, but uh, there is a, a, a good number of researchers all over Europe. They've formed, uh, uh, they've done several projects. Uh, the the, uh, the Neoplex project and now more recently the, um, the I, I forgot the name at this moment, uh, but there is, a, of course, the, the, the Homer project where pressure from PIV is really at, on top of their agenda. And uh, you are right that uh, the, the, the boundary conditions for pressure are uh, still problematic. And um, um, many, many algorithms, many good algorithms just fail because of uh, uh, inappropriate uh, boundary conditions. So I, I think that the problem of boundary conditions for pressure from PIV is uh, not solved in the most general sense. There, there, we, we need some more research there. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. I, I don't I don't have uh, the, the magic trick there for that. Okay, this is what I want to know. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Uh, any more questions? Uh, I remind you that you can just open your mic if you want to, to ask a question or you can also write it in the chat and I, uh, I'm going to read it. I will ask another question. Uh, could you could you give what is the Reynolds number of your flow when you make the flow control, and uh, do you think it's work at very high Reynolds number? Very good point. Very good point. You are uh, you are you are uh, asking for all the things that I've I've hidden. <laughs> Uh, now the Reynolds number is a, is a modest Reynolds number. As you see, the, the velocity is uh, quite low, only three meter per second in this boundary layer. And below three meter per second, the, the tunnel would even refuse to start. Um, so uh, RE theta is about a thousand. Hmm? Um, if we, we think that um, one could significantly increase this RE theta maybe 2,000, 2,500. The problem is that the mechanical actuation starts becoming quite a, a challenge of itself. We have a counterbalance, as you see from this uh, video. There is a counterweight. We have a very good technician that uh, did, a, did a, a, um, what's called a composite plate that is very light, uh, but there are limits anyways. We, we, cannot, we cannot think of oscillating it at 100 hertz. Uh, now it's 15, probably we can go to 30 and 40 hertz. And beyond that, uh, is not so reasonable to do that. But the main interest, in fact, it is only what we call it step zero. <clears throat> we are now doing research and uh, we are not the only ones, there are other groups, uh, but we are doing research uh, where we now try to surrogate the effect of this uh, sliding plate uh, from a mechanical actuator to an electrical actuator by using uh, 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 AC, DBD plasma actuators. So um, it's not so easy to produce exactly the same motion, but we think we can produce the same type of stimulus to the flow. And these plasma ACDBD actuators, they can, they can uh, easily do hundreds of hertz because of their electric nature. 
Um, the answer to your question is whether we can also do higher velocity. I cannot give really a definite answer yet because when we increase the flow velocity, also the, uh, the friction velocity will increase. And uh, uh, these actuators are known to be a bit weak. So we have to see if uh, uh, we have enough frequency, but we might not have enough amplitude of the fluctuations. This is research that is going on as we speak. So my student is really in the laboratories uh, testing the actuators and uh, I'll, be, I'll be delighted to, to, to present some updates in uh, some time. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, so is, is there any, any other question for, for the presentation? About the presentation? This does not seem to be the case. I, I may ask one, one quick question that's uh, uh, related to the algorithm you, you used. Uh, uh, so I think it's, it's called VIC. And uh, there you, you mentioned that uh, you removed actually the, uh, the viscous part. Do you think there are regimes in which that part of the reconstruction would uh, play an important role in the reconstruction or uh, speculate um, it's not effective? That's, uh, that's a frequent question and the, the, the frequent answer is no. Uh, in the sense that uh, uh, in, in many, when we speak about turbulent flows, especially in turbulent flows, the time at which we reconstruct the supersampling okay. is so short anyways that the effect of viscosity to play a role there. So we should not forget that the observation of, uh, let me use this pen here, a laser pointer. Yeah, we start from this observation, this, this term and this term in order to produce an estimate of how the flow will progress. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the observation is the observation of mother nature. So mother nature has the viscosity there. That's, yeah. that's no problem. Your observation is correct mm -hmm. because it's not say viscosity biased. Uh, assuming that we are resolving the scales, however. So let's assume we resolve the viscosity and the observation is correct. Then this uh, uh, d omega in dt, uh, the flow has to advance in time and uh, uh, we, we can kind of prioritize. The, the, the first type of uh, force that is uh, important in this is the inertia force, then you have the pressure force and, um, uh, and then you have a conservation of uh, angular momentum and then you also have some viscosity. But when you, when, if you make an, um, like a dimensional analysis of an order of magnitude analysis, you end up with these viscous terms that are extremely, extremely small, typically 10 to the minus two with respect to the dominant terms. And given that this is still a measurement, uh, if you don't go for an integration that is very, very long, then uh, this 10 to the minus two, in fact, can be considered within the noise of the measurement. Now, exceptions can be, and of problems that have not been solved yet. How do we run this type of reconstructions in presence of a wall? How do we impose the presence of a wall? How do we model the effect of wall? And there the viscosity plays a role. So there uh, I'm not able to give an answer and could be actually a nice topic to, to uh, I, I would like to review a paper on that, on that topic. Okay, okay, thanks. Thank you for the very uh, clear answer. Um, I think uh, uh, we we can uh, uh, we have actually dedicated enough time to to questions, and uh, I would like to to thank uh, uh, Fulvio once again for uh, this very interesting, very um, detailed talk, and for uh, sharing his time to to reply to to the questions of the participants. And I would like also to to thank the participants for taking part in the discussion. So thank you all. Yeah. Likewise, I like again, uh, I thank you for the invitation and I also appreciate uh, so much interest from the participants. So I, I'm really delighted of it. So, uh, thanks and uh, I, uh, I invite you to, to, to attend the next uh, meetings. Uh, I remind you that the uh, LMFL uh, seminar is always at uh, uh, 4.30 p.m. Paris time on uh, Thursday. So hope to, to see you all next Thursday and have a good evening. Goodbye, everybody. Stay healthy.